Hi, today we're interviewing Dr. Mark Griffiths at Nottingham Trent University. Uh, just to start us off, Mark, I was hoping you could briefly summarise the kinds of research you do. Okay, I've spent the last 27 years studying um, gambling. Uh, my main area has looked at problem gambling, not that I'm anti-gambling in the slightest. Obviously, I think the gaming industry and we as researchers should be concerned about those where gambling affects their lives, their finances, everything that, that people do. Um, it's, you know, I think what's amazing in this country is that people often perceive me as being public en enemy. Sorry, people often perceive me as being public enemy number one because I research problem gambling. Yet my friends who research problem drinking, no one ever accuses them of being anti-drinking. Uh, there is a culture in this country that if you in any way attack the industry for the products that they, they put out there and people get into problems, they take it personally. But of course, I think we should be working together. Surely, in terms of a long-term business model. Problem gamblers are not good in terms of making profits because they've got such a short shelf life. I also think that the kind of business models gambling operators should be doing is instead of using the kind of 90-10 rule where 10% of the customers generate 90% of the, you know, 90 of the profits, they should be going for, you know, if you look at Camelot for instance, they've got the vast majority of the population spending small amounts of money and making huge profits and I would like to see that to convert to the slot machine industry and the casino sector, the bingo sector, because I think that would be better for all of us. Wonderful. Well, we've touched on quite a few uh, core points of the interview, so let's try and elucidate those one by one. First off, I'd like to start with some questions about the perceptions of gambling in the British media. So. Over the past year, the mainstream media has been pretty vocal in its criticism of the gambling industry. Uh, the Guardian went with a headline, Roulette Machines, the Crack Cocaine of Gambling, while the Daily Mail reported a terrifying parable of the addictive power of internet gambling. Uh, what do you make of this criticism, and do you feel it's in any way justified? I think when you talk about the media, is that the media's job okay is to report news but they like to report bad news mm -hmm. they you know it's amazing how whenever i do a piece of, of research if it's a good news story maybe 10 percent of the papers will pick it up if it's a bad news story 90 percent of the papers will pick it up basically misery and bad things sell newspapers uh, so I, I don't think it's actually that they're, they're anti-gambling it's just that they're anti-everything if it does something wrong within society and of course there are some papers like the daily mail who, you know, the editor has got a particular thing about gambling and is very anti-gambling. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that the mail consistently come up with, you know, negative stories. Uh, but to be honest, it's very hard to have a positive gambling story. I mean, the positive gambling stories are usually reflecting big lottery winners, you know, something that usually the companies want to put into the papers. Uh, but it doesn't surprise me that addiction is what sells newspapers, and if it's a gambling addiction, then you know they hope that readers will want to, to actually read those kinds of things. And following from that, if it's the case that it's substantially harder to put out a positive gambling story versus a negative story, does that in any way suggest that that negative coverage is justified? Does it suggest that there are fewer positive stories to tell about gambling? Well, the bottom line is, is that all research consistently shows that a small minority of gamblers do get into trouble with the activity they're engaged in. By the, con you know, the consequence of that means that the vast majority of people who gamble don't have any problems at all, but that doesn't sell newspapers. Sure. You know, a story that says most people enjoy gambling is not going to make news, whereas you know, 1% of the population addicted to gambling, I mean, I don't believe that there is 1% addicted to, to, to gambling, and one of the problems we've got is that when we do studies, we actually rarely mention the word addiction. We'll talk about things like pathological or problem gambling, and the press then equates that as equaling addiction. So, for instance, the, you know, the, what's called the British Gambling uh, Prevalence Survey, which we do every few years, the latest survey said that 0.9% of Britons have a gambling problem. The press interpreted that as nearly 1% are addicted. Now, the thing is, is that you know, all gambling addicts are problem gamblers, but not all problem gamblers are addicts. You know, problem gambling can be, you know, problem gambling could just mean that you spend far too much of your disposable income on gambling, but it may not actually be indicative of addiction. You know, and that, that is one of the problems we've got, is that the press will use and interchange words to suit their story. Uh, and I do think we have to kind of contextualise this. You know, I've spent, this, I've spent over a quarter of a century researching gambling problems. And yes, we know that a small but significant minority have problems. The number of people who are genuinely addicted in the same way that people are addicted to alcohol or heroin and other things is actually very, very small. You know, because there are very key criteria to what addiction actually is. But of course, if somebody turns around and says, I'm a problem gambler, and that problem might be that it's causing relationship problems or it's causing financial problems, 
that would be defined within the British Gambling Prevalence Survey probably as a as a problem. But you, you'd be amazed that you know the number of problem gamblers who are genuinely addicted to gambling, at least how I define it, is actually very, very small. Okay, well, we're going to touch again yeah, no, on no, no, the no. issue of, addic of addiction. No, it's fantastic right. that we have this kind of summary. Um, do you think the media is categorically anti-gambling, or is it merely critical of the gambling industry in its current form? So is there any capacity for the media to be positive about gambling if it were to change? Okay. Um, I don't think the, 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 you know, the national British press are anti-gambling per se, but as I say, at the end of the day, they are running a business and they have to sell newspapers or they have to get subscriptions online, and as I say, I think if you're, if you're pointing out really bad things that happen, more people are, are likely to read that. You know, we as human beings, we always like to compare ourselves to other people. Mm. You know, we, in, psychology, sorry, in psychology terms, we call this social comparison theory. It's a bit like keeping up with the Joneses. When you read about the misery of somebody else, it makes you feel better. And in fact, you know, most newspaper stories are about death and destruction and misery and addiction. You know, these are the kind of things that editors believe people want to read because it makes people feel better about themselves. So I don't think that the, the British press, you know, on the whole is anti-gambling, but that's not to say there aren't some editors out there that have an anti-gambling stance. I think most people would agree if you look at the Daily Mail coverage over the last six or seven years, it has been really anti-gambling and it really tries to make a mountain out of a molehill. Now I'll give you an example, in, in 2006 I ended up on the front page of the Daily Mail and the headline was Gambling with a Generation and the first line was basically said, you know, British psychologist says millions of children will become addicted to gambling. <laughs> right now, this was just total poppycock. You know, the journalist was a guy called Tim Shipman who now works at the Washington Post. You know, I said to myself, I'm not going to be interviewed by Tim, but, you know, so for instance, one of my findings which was in a study that we did, we found that 4% of all juvenile crime in one particular city was related to slot machine playing. That was then reported as one in four youngsters had, had committed crimes because of gambling. You know, to take 4% and make it one in four, I mean, it's just shocking journalism. Uh, now, as I say, Paul Dacre, the editor of the, the Daily Mail, has consistently been kind of anti-gambling, and I'm sure that's why a lot of anti-gambling stories get into the, the Daily Mail. Now, that doesn't stop me being interviewed by them, because I like to get my point across. But again, if you look at all the stories I personally have been involved with the Daily Mail over the last year, nearly all of them have involved things like gambling via Facebook, and it's all about trying to point out that you know, millions of women or children are going to have problems with this activity. And of course I've never said that at all, but of course one quote can be taken out of context to, to actually sell that particular story. Okay, well we've promised to steer away from any apocalyptic... No, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why do you think gambling is so heavily demonised when other arguably more destructive vices like alcohol and junk food escape the same level of scrutiny by the media? Well, I actually, I actually disagree with that. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't just research in gambling addictions. You know, I research in, in most behavioural addictions, including um, things like video game addiction, exercise addiction, sex addiction. You know, my work touches on things like obesity. I was part of the government's uh, working group on sedentary behaviour. Mm -hmm. In terms of what comes out in the papers, I, I can tell you now, obesity is one of those things that's just as lambasted as, as, as gambling. Yeah, so I don't believe that gambling is demonised anymore. I mean, obviously, I think most people accept that alcohol, when taken to excess, is, is problematic. Most people know that alcohol is a potentially addictive drug. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing it. I mean, I drink alcohol, I love drinking alcohol. Uh, I think most people who, who, who partake actually like that particular activity, but you know, I know that a small proportion of the population get into trouble with it. Gambling is another one of those consumptive behaviours that, in, in, like alcohol, it's kind of socially condoned, socially accepted, but when taken to excess, can lead to problems, but I think most people's conception of, of alcoholism and heroin addiction versus things like gambling addiction is that, you know, I think alcohol and heroin might be seen as more medically legitimate than gambling, and I think there are some people out there who would probably say that gambling is that person's own fault, it's due to weak will or whatever, and they don't think it's a genuine problem, but I would argue is that just like alcohol, Gambling is one of those activities. Yes, there are individual risk factors, but the way that, for instance, market, you know, gambling is marketed or advertised, the way that games are actually designed and developed, does mean that vulnerable and susceptible individuals can get into problems. Okay. 
Why do you think the media is apparently unwilling to regard gambling in moderation as a legitimate form of entertainment? Why isn't it willing to take that stance? Well, I, again, I would disagree that it isn't willing to take that stance. I think, you know, there are loads and loads of gambling stories, as I say, I say but most of them tend to be more negative because I believe that's what they think will sell papers or what people want to read. Um, you know, I... Sorry, what was the, I don't know where I was going there. What was the, the question again? Um, why do you feel that the media is apparently unwilling to right. regard gambling in moderation as okay, a digital form of entertainment? Okay. okay. Um, I suppose gambling in moderation, it's one of those uh, activities that because it costs money for people to do, there are a lot of people, you know, particularly in a time of recession when suppose there's not a lot of money about, mm. is that spending your, if you like, your finite leisure pound on gambling rather than something that's more productive, or at least what the papers see as more productive, would lead to people viewing that negatively. Now, of course, in the recession, people, you know, there are two views about what happens to gambling in a recession. Some people argue that because it's a recession, there's not a lot of money around, so people try and maximise their, their kind of financial um, outlay by actually gambling and trying to win more money because they can't get it through the job. For other people, because they haven't got much money, gambling is an activity that will just drop out of their kind of leisure repertoire because they can't afford to do it. And my guess is both of those things kind of, you know, cancel each other out. However, if you look at, for instance, the number of new bookmakers that have sprung up in the last kind of couple of years, it does suggest that gambling is one of those things, it may not be recession proof, but it does seem to be one of the few businesses that doesn't seem to be negatively affected by the recession. Having said that, um, it, that might very well be true in the UK, but we've done a separate study where we've looked at the fi um, travel figures to Las Vegas, and they've taken an absolute nosedive since the global recession in 2008, so it does seem to indicate that um, tra casino tourism, if you like, isn't recession-proof in a way that... Oh, but there's a difference is. between being, you know, the, the example of Las Vegas, and I went to Las Vegas in, in June, I took my, the whole of my family to Caesars Hotel, Caesars Palace, and we stayed there, the thing about that, of course, you know, that cost me four thousand pounds just to get there before I'm even gambling. You know, that you know, if there was a you know a kind of Las Vegas type casino on somebody's back doorstep, <laughs> I think even in a recession, people would actually flock to go to there. The fact that the number of trips to Las Vegas is down is just the you know the pure prohibitive cost of actually getting to Las Vegas in the in the first place is not to do with gambling in and of itself. Okay, and uh, last question about media coverage. Okay. What do you make of media outlets such as The Sun that condemn gambling in its coverage but sanction it as a business opportunity by running a bingo platform? Isn't this just blatant hypocrisy? Okay, well, it, it's just totally hypocritical. Yeah. You know, any, any newspaper that is anti gambling and then actually profits from people gambling either through their website or through, you know, some type, you know, some kind of their product. Um, it's just, you know, it, I can't think of another word other than hypocrisy. Yeah, well, that was the word we felt as well, so <laughs> I'm glad you agree there.